So I, uh, I changed the title because based on the set of people who are going to be attending, which are I learned that are mostly MSc and MTech and grad students. So I want to talk to you about actually what are the things you can do in the future. Uh, before I go, since I was, you know, delayed, it's already uh, 20 minutes into the seminar. So what should I aim for? Should I aim for 10 minutes or should I go for? No, you can take your full time, half an hour, because there's nothing right after your talk. All right, good. Then I, I, I aim for half an hour. Yeah. So, so what are the new things that one can do in neuroengineering and neurophysics for people who are engineers or physicists? Of course, neuroscientists can do a lot. And in particular, for the last 10 years, we have been doing a lot of research uh, using virtual and augmented reality to ask a lot of interesting questions. And here are the, this is an old photo, but the lab is still the same. And I'll be telling you research today by Karen Safarian, who had a paper in Nature Neuroscience last uh, month, Jason Moore, who is going to have a paper in Nature uh, next month and Chinmay Purandre, who is actually an I IIT uh, student who is not here, who joined after and did extremely well, who is going to have a paper in Nature the week after. So we are in golden territory right now. So what we do and why are we able to do these things? Uh, we, of course, like everybody else, are interested in behavior, uh, whether disease or not. And we also know that happens due to something in the brain where things change, unlike many other parts of the body, cells, synapses, and so on, genomics, all kinds of things change. And in between is this network. That's what makes the brain special. Things change even in your heart and lungs and liver, but not as much as the brain. But on top of it, brain is this network. Each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons, which is very unique. Any other part of your body, Every cell connects to maybe 20 other neighboring cells, unless it's a cell that's traveling, but then it doesn't really have much connection. So how does it work? And it's a hard problem. And we want to know how cellular changes lead to changes in network dynamics. And how do changes in network dynamics influence behavior and vice versa? Because right now, behavior called you hearing my words is changing your network dynamics. And if you remember anything, it is inducing cellular changes so that you'll remember it for very long period. So how does it all work? This is seemingly impossible. There are many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, the number of neurons itself is 100 billion. The number of synapses in the network are 100 or more trillion plus. And how, how, how does one even, and the number of behaviors are seemingly very small. So how do one link these things? It's a serious challenge, mathematical challenge as well as engineering challenge. Uh, so we don't do this work. We read about these things. Then we use math to come up with theories. Then we do experiment here. Then do math to link these because this is a massive dimensional space and this is a small dimensional space. And then we do these experiments. So that's how we make sense. So for those of you who don't know neuroscience, as I imagine some of you are, uh, systems neuroscience, there are many branches of neuroscience. Systems neuroscience can be broadly categorized into two sets of experiments, two class of experiments. Very simply put, here was the experiment done by Hubel and Wiesel, which got the Nobel Prize in 1961 or 62. The experiment was this. There is a cat uh, which sits in front of a screen. And on the, on the screen, they presented stimulus, which was a specific colored stimulus, in this case, black, of a specific orientation, in which case it's about uh, minus 20 degrees and at a particular place on the screen, in which case it's at the center, which can be top, bottom, left, right, uh, all of it makes a difference. And they record it from one particular brain area called the primary visual cortex. And the discovery was that as a function of exactly when this stimulus is turned on, what is its property, whether it's bright or dark or green or yellow, exactly where it is on the screen, what is its orientation, which way it's moving. These neurons in primary visual cortex all the way at the back, pretty much the first station from the eyes, it goes to the thalamus, to the primary visual cortex. 
the first stage in visual processing encodes all these properties. All these multiple properties are encoded by these neurons in a very concrete way. If you change the stimulus prop angle, it changes by a predictable amount. If you change the contrast, it changes by a predictable amount. If you change, <clears throat> for example, the location where the stimulus is presented or the property of the stimulus entirely instead of an oriented bar, you use something else, maybe natural scenes. Of course, much harder to generalize from this to natural scenes. So these are very, very specific and concrete responses to very, very particular stimulus. And now, around 10 years after that, people said, wait a minute, you know, we don't sit in front of a screen, let alone a cat staring at a screen is a hard one. Uh, what about we just take animals and let them behave naturally? So here is an image of some experiments that were done early on, around 1960s and 70s. And the first report was published here. When there is a rat just walking around in an arena, uh, you have no idea what the rat sees. You have no idea what exactly the stimulus, maybe it's something food that fell in front of him. Maybe there was some contrast on the screen. Maybe there was some sound of something else. Maybe he was walking around the footsteps. Maybe he was simply excited by what he was doing. Maybe his movement. We don't know any of it. But when they did this experiment, they found that unlike the primary visual cortex, which is right at the beginning, so-called sensory periphery, if you go farthest away from sensory periphery to the deepest part of the brain in many ways, uh, perhaps farthest removed from sensory periphery in area called the hippocampus, you get responses called place cells. So, and these are sort of be abstract responses. A neuron codes for whether the rat is here or whether the rat is there or there or there. And we don't know what is here. And so neocortex, and the same thing applies to many, many parts of neocortex, by the way. You go to auditory cortex, they respond to different sound properties. You go to somatosensory cortex, they respond to different kinds of touch in different parts of the body or the whiskers and so on, and, and so on and so forth. So that's been essentially systems neuroscience. Large amount of system neuroscience has been this mapping out many, many different parts of the brain, how exactly they respond to specific stimuli. Concrete stimuli, specific features of those. Other research, a much smaller part of the research that's been going on since 1960s, 70s, is this, you let the rat behave freely. And these days people are doing even uh, animals watching movies. So there is this thing, and I hope that this is not obstructing your view. It says abstract representation of space, not sensory responses. So it's a complicated circuit that I won't bother showing you, but you can look it up. It's a massive circuit evolving daily. At one end of the circuit, the inputs are exactly known very, very precisely, much faster and much more precisely than you yourself can actually recognize. If I were to show you a movie, uh, sorry, an image of my face, the neurons in primary visual cortex will capture exactly here was a little edge for the chin, here was a little edge corresponding to the hair and so on and so forth. Different neurons will capture that, but none of the neurons will know that it's a face. Here on the other hand, the neurons capture an abstract thing called space. Or if you go to IT cortex, the neuron captures, hey, this is a face. And if you have damage to this deeper brain area, such as hippocampus and RT, IT cortex, then subjects can see things, but they cannot identify things or they get lost. So this has been a major mystery. How does the brain create abstract representations from concrete stimuli? And that's of course has been on steroids these days, that question from the point of view of artificial intelligence, because that's one thing artificial intelligence cannot do, which is abstraction and generalization, which is very robust to noise. This neuron will code for this orientation, even if you threw a bunch of noise here, AI totally gets busted. Let alone, instead of just an orientation, you throw a face here. Whereas here, the neuron will still identify. So how do we go from here to here and vice versa? Where is intelligence in all this? And therein lies a lot of clinical problems. These deeper brain areas are where the stroke happens. 
hippocampus is, for example, a brain region which is hit by Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, PTSD, schizophrenia, depression, uh, ADHD, you name it. And just and most of them are untreatable. Alzheimer's, for example, starting with that or autism, which we research on, they're mostly untreatable. Because in my opinion, we don't understand what the transformation is. So our goal is to understand how does the brain create this amazing complex representations. Lots of neuroscientists work on this, rightly so. This is not fully understood, but reasonably well understood about how these concrete representations arise. But this is a major challenge. So the, there are many puzzles and I'm going to list a few of them and see what we can do with it. Experiments, spatial learning in rats, uh, if you let a rat run around in that maze, the neurons represent to where the rat is in space. But if you were to measure what goes on in hippocampus and the hippocampus damage happens, such as in Alzheimer's disease, the human beings are actually lost in episodic learning. For example, if some of you had the unfortunate uh, incidents of epilepsy that was intractable and your hippocampus was removed, you will enjoy this lecture while it's going on. But if it was interrupted as it was for 20 minutes and then you come back, You'll have no idea who I am, let alone remember the content. So very devastating. But what's the relationship between episodic memories, such as I learned this on this day, versus where you are in space? Another level of abstraction. From abstraction to even more abstraction, we don't know. Rodents are supposed to have abstract representation of space, and so are human and non-human primates. What about they? How are our brains representing space? What is, in fact, space, which was my thesis topic of abstract space in quantum physics. A lot of research that's going on, hippocampus, of course, because of these clinical reasons, as well as scientific and engineering reasons, is heavily studied. People have found that the same neurons which are place cells sometimes behave like time cells, sometimes behave like episode cells, sometimes behave like vector cells. So what is this? How, how, how is the same neuron doing different things, whereas the visual cortical neuron does exactly the same thing, whether you put an oriented bar or something else. Even bigger problem going, so these are more physics-y problems or, engine or AI problems, but more practically, how do you turn on or turn off neurons without surgery or drugs? Like one can give massive electric shock to somebody to turn off neurons, but that turns off neurons across the whole brain and that is a very, very painful thing. So you can't do it to people. There are novel approaches such as you can put electrodes in the brain, but that requires surgery. There are approaches like optogenetics, but that requires even genetic transfection and then surgeries. So that is a problem. And we want to actually do this thing in such a way that we create brain machine interface, a major challenge. But brain-machine interface without surgeries, because none of us honestly will go through surgeries. Definitely not me, not a brain surgery. Now, another fascinating thing that has been found that all these amazing things that are going on, neural activity, as well as diseases, they are mediated by something that the brain itself generates on its own that you cannot perceive. These are called brain rhythms. Uh, there are all sorts of things. If you just type brain rhythm, you'll come up with a million citations probably. There are books written about it by very bright people. Hippocampus, for example, as soon as you start walk, generates this prominent rhythm called theta rhythm, 70,000 citations discovered 60 years ago. As soon as you stop, the theta rhythm goes away. If you fall asleep, the theta rhythm is gone. If you start to dream, the theta rhythm is back and then it's gone again. And many, many diseases that I told you, they are correlated with theta rhythm. Alzheimer's disease, theta rhythm gets impaired. ADHD, theta rhythm is impaired. Conversely, if pharmacologically you can impair theta rhythm, then the cognition is impaired, such as your ability to remember or rat's ability to navigate is impaired. So there is some mysterious link between brain rhythms and behavior but we don't know how to manipulate them. There are many, many drugs. Brain rhythms is a major pharmaceutical target going for hundreds of billions of dollars, but they have non-specific effects, side effects and so on, and surgeries, which is not an option. And the effect is minor. So that's another somewhat low hanging fruit, but we can't do much. And the biggest question is what is reality? 
This is the common problem with all of us. We don't think that's true, but we, it's true. I can swear this morning that, hey, I put my car keys here. Where did it go? Well, that's one glitch in reality. The ultimate version is, of course, me not remembering what I heard in the seminar or somebody has schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease who confabulate things. So what is reality? Even a deeper sense beyond that. So virtual reality is a way to do this. And we have been doing this in many ways. I will just flash these slides. You can read this. We have been looking at how does the brain learn? Then how does it learn to predict what's going to happen using very simple circuit way before deep networks were popular. Uh, all the way back in 1997, we made a simple multi-layer networks which can do predictive coding, a major research topic in uh, these things, uh, in AI. Uh, play, we discovered this phenomenon that these place cells learn very, very quickly. I'm not going to tell you what these things are. I'm sorry, I should have taken off the slide, but I thought I will leave it so that you can go ahead and look at these papers about how to link the so-called <clears throat> changes in single neurons activity and the cellular changes. And now we want to go to behavior. But the question that I want to share with you today is what are place cells? What is navigational learning? And how can we turn on and turn off neurons and change brain rhythms? So here's an experiment that I'm going to share with you. So here's a maze. Intentionally, this is a, a big room, four meters by four meters. It's sound insulated, light insulated, uh, EMF insulated. One million dollars we spent on making four rooms like this. On the walls, we can project very, very salient stimuli. So this is three by three meter wall. And on which we put one stimulus here, other stimulus here, third here, fourth here. These are created mathematically so you can morph them clearly. Notice one petal of the flower is missing here. All that will become important in the future. And on the bottom of the floor is this checkered pattern, like any rooms with the tile. And on top of the floor, about 50 meters from it, there is a table. And the table is all kinds of random local pattern. When the rat, this is about two meters in diameter. When the rat is here, just by looking at the pattern, he can't tell where he is. This is also replaced by random patterns sometimes. But he has to create a map of this space simply by using triangulation. So classic experiment of O'Keefe uh, in 1971, which got them the Nobel Prize uh, in 2014. But we wanted to do this super carefully. So we want to remove all the other stimuli and we want to make the floor confusing. Even then there'll be olfactory cues that he will leave, but we'll do that later. So let's listen to one neuron out of a billion in hippocampus and we can do that with hundreds of neurons using this technology in rat brain. And let's listen in. So how do these neurons create these abstract maps? Just starting first by simply looking at vision and then we'll add audition, olfaction and other things and noise and so on. So let's listen to that, all right? So hopefully you will hear the sounds as well. Uh, so that's going to run around. So here is the video. This is the rendering of actual data. So. I hope you heard the sound. There was a crackle of spikes here. Each dot is one spike. Each punctate sound is one spike. Now I'm going to speed it up. So, so this is about half an hour of data. There was a piece of chocolate that was falling all over the place. The experimenter was throwing it from the outside. This was a very careful experiment in the real world. Uh, probably the cleanest real world experiment of place cell by removing all kinds of noise and sound and so on. And still you got a beautiful place cell. So this seems to suggest that maybe the reason the cell is active here is because when the rat is here, he sees a unique configuration of cues. When he's here and facing this way, he sees this circle and to in front and this weird pattern to the left and the spiral to the right. But when he's here, he sees a, a, a flower in front and something else on the sides. And one can localize the rat uniquely at every place by triangulation with respect to these cubes. But then there are other puzzles. And that's the cognitive map theory that got the Nobel Prize. Now the puzzle is this. If that were true, then when you turn off the light, this place cell should disappear. They don't. In fact, blind rats are perfectly good place cells. If you wipe the floor at the end of the experiment, or if you simply, then the place cells get messed up. If you rotate the floor, 
while leaving the cues in the walls as they are 60% of layered cells are rotating. And in fact, when the rat is here and he looks this way versus that way, the same neuron fires in exactly the same way as claimed by O'Keefe in his 2014 Nobel speech and shown in many, many papers. So how can that be? If it is this triangulation, then when the rat is here and faces this way versus that way, it's entirely different visual scene. So many puzzles. Uh, so we want to check this idea. Is this abstraction based on triangulation? Or is it due to other cues that we did not remove, particularly olfactory cues, which are very important for rats and for humans? Look at COVID. People during COVID lose sense of smell and then they get lost. They have cognitive decline and people become less intelligent with COVID. There is a paper showing significant loss of intelligence. So something funny going on about that. Auditory cues which reach hippocampus and maybe rats are paying attention to their own sound of footsteps as shown by none other than great Richard Feynman in his book. So go ahead and read his book. Surely you are joking, Mr. Feynman. Uh, there are vestibular cues our, inside our head. I rotate my head in the darkness left to right. I know that I'm facing a little more to the right or a little more to the left. There are smells on the ground, of course, which is the most important. So the thing that I'm going to tell you is that the way hippocampus works is a deep network, which is a hierarchical network and it integrates multi-sensory associations in a complex way. In, in that it generalizes uh, this kind of generalization and abstraction. So how did we reach that? To go forward between the precise cortical experiment and hippocampus, we build this non-invasive virtual reality. Uh, so there's a big styrofoam ball that rotates when the rat runs. And this is different than standard VR because standard VR, you can't see your hand. That's not good. Uh, and you can't see your feet. You can't really see the real scene. Whereas here, as the rat moves, the VR engine in a computer outside picks up the movement sends the image to this Pico projector that sends the image to this brief, uh, a metallic mirror that astrophys astronomers know how to make well in our department that sends the image all around the rat. So he's immersed in it. And now as he walks around, he walks in a weird room that we have made up. In this case, exactly like the real world, just to check. So all the smells and so on are present, but they don't go with where he goes in the virtual room. So non-specific cues like sound, texture, smells are eliminated. We can do many, many trials because in this case, the rat vessel and tuxedo, and he can do many trials and he can get water from here. So just like a human being, he drinks some water, runs around. We can do very reliable electrophysiology and monitor with a hidden camera here exactly what he's doing. And the same experiment can be done. This is designed in such a way that you can remove this thing and stick a human head here. So one can play the exact same experiment for a rat and a human or a primate. So that allows a huge translation. So here's an actual experiment with a camera right behind the rat. So you see that he's drinking a bit of water here. Let me lower the volume. And while he drinks water, this virtual pillar, which looks very compelling, but it's just on the screen, he has to go underneath it. And they don't like to do that naturally because they avoid some things above, but look, he's learned to like it. And he associates it with reward. He keeps looking at it so we can do very high level imaging of his behavior and signals. Now he notices the bottom of the screen and says, hey, by motion parallax, that ground is moving at a different speed from the platform because it's half a meter away. So he run, turns away from this. So he is creating a three dimensional map of space from purely visual stimuli. And now we are going to do another experiment. Look, he's looking around for the pillar. He sees now the second trial from the corner of his eyes, takes him much less to run through. And these videos, by the way, are on our lab's webpage, so you can see them all and so on. He's going to do a little moonwalk here to avoid the cliff, but let me keep moving. Now, if the theory was right of cognitive mapping, this was the cleanest experiment. The rat sees only visual cues as he walks. All the other cues are cleaned out. You should get beautiful extra representation of hippocampus. What we found is a new way to turn off neurons. So as I showed you earlier, I mentioned that we can record the activity of hundreds of neurons simultaneously for months together. When he runs, when he sleeps, when he dreams, we can read off his dreams. 
all kinds of funky stuff. So this is just one tetrode out of hundreds that we can put. And that says these different neurons. Each ellipse is a different neuron. I won't have time to show you how, uh, how uh, uh, techniques in AI, machine learning, and blind source signal segregation can help do that. There's lots of interesting things you can do. When the same rat with the same electrodes runs in the same environment, visual environment, RW for real world versus VR for virtual reality, you can see many, many neurons simply turned off. In fact, 60% of neurons in hippocampal area C1 turned off in virtual reality. Very, very reliable across six rats, many, many trials and so on. So this is for the first time any human being found a way to turn off neurons reliably in the same environment, in hippocampus. Now that's a big deal. You may say, well, why do this? Let the rat go to sleep. Then the neuron should totally turn off. Remarkably, that doesn't happen. It turns out that when the rat goes to sleep, the number of neurons that are active in hippocampus actually doubles than the real world. In the real world, in any given environment, it's a sparse representation. At most, 50% neurons are active. When he goes to sleep, that's when more or less 100% neurons are active. In reality, even then they are not 100%, but certainly more than the real world. So virtual reality is doing something which is not actually sleep and much less than the real world, a new territory. So this can turn into a therapy for all kinds of diseases when the neurons are too active, completely different and a new kind of brain machine interface without any electrodes, completely reversible, instant, and can be delivered at home. So then we look at the spatial maps. Here was the activity pattern of one neuron in the real world when the rat was running. And as I showed you, and you hear the crackle, is a neuron, the, all the dots are spikes. This neuron has a beautiful place cell right here. Didn't fire anywhere else. When the same neuron fired in virtual reality, Actually, it had no concept of space. Instead of that, that neuron was encoding brief segments of distance or time, an invariant representation. And the distance and time, you can notice these spike patterns are not random. Whenever they appear, this is so-called, I call my string theory of the hippocampus, they all look like little strings thrown all over the place. Very little spatial selectivity, same neuron. Neurons start to represent invariant distance. And of course, we know from physics that invariant distance is what you can use to create absolute space. So since I will run out of time, if I'm not going to run out of time already, I'm going to skip how it sounds. I'm going to skip the techniques by which we detected all this stuff and where it comes from and go to the next level, which I'm sure you'd want to hear because that's the latest paper that just came out in Nature Neuroscience and very popular. Lots of people are super excited, lots of news reports and so on which is that we just found that we can actually change the brain rhythm using this ultimate of virtual reality, right? There is no VR system, there is no delay, there, there is no total immersion, completely comfortable, and still we are finding these things. So here is one electrode in hippocampus, and we are measuring the average signal, not just very precise signal of one and two or 100 neurons one at a time. So in x-axis is time, about two to three seconds of data. Y-axis is the voltage on that signal. Notice that voltage is pretty high. You can measure it at home. That's how easy it is. Well, not from hippocampus, but from neocortex, because this is just about half a millivolt, pretty gigantic. And in green line is the local field potential fluctuating away. And it's been filtered in the theta band, theta rhythm, as I told you, 80, 60, 70 years ago discovered, is about eight hertz in frequency. Very, very clear theta rhythm. There is a lot more going on than theta. There's gamma rhythm and all kinds of things, but I won't have time for that. That's why I'm going to show you the power spectrum that goes only up to 20 hertz. Lots of fun things beyond that. We have written many papers about gamma rhythm and so on, but let me forget that. You see a prominent peak at theta rhythm in power spectrum. This average, the standard error is invisible. These error bars exist. And you see another harmonic there at two times theta. So everything is as as people have seen many, many years ago, the harmonic is on topping in itself. If some of you want to work on it, happy to talk to you about those things. But what Karen Safarian did, a very bright postdoc in the lab, 
is to look carefully at the electrodes in virtual reality. Same electrode now, same rat running in virtual reality. Notice the green signal now. We're going to get into the filter signal. Got much bigger. This was only half a millivolt. This became 1.2 millivolt. But then the signal got more complex. If you filter in the theta band, you still see theta rhythm. Its amplitude of this blue trace, which is theta band, is more or less the same here. But that doesn't capture the whole signal because there's all these other weird things going on. You have to include another signal, which is about half the frequency is theta rhythm. That's a new rhythm that we discovered called eta rhythm that captures most of that signal. So we not only managed to boost theta rhythm, a major pharmaceutical target that companies are trying to do, hundreds of billions of dollars have gone into it, but we managed to change a brain rhythm. In fact, we discovered a whole new brain rhythm after 70 years of research. So major advancement, that's why the paper is very popular, rightly so, took a lot of effort. There is a lot more interesting thing here to do, but I'm just going to show you a couple more things. Let me even skip it, how it behaves with behavior and running speed, just to show you that it works. Uh, I'm going to show you techniques by which, engineering techniques by which you can capture this. Single neurons, not just the in average activity of field potential, here are about 400 neurons in the real world. They show somewhat poor rhythmicity, lasting one to two cycles, three cycle at most. Here are the same 400 neurons in virtual reality. They keep going rhythmically one, two, three, four, even more cycles. And you can see their average activity of individual neurons. They show enhanced rhythmicity, massive effect sizes. You can look at inhibitor neurons. They do, they, you say, well, pyramidal neurons are lose place cell. Let me look at inhibitor neurons. Here are the inhibitor neurons in the real world, showing you one, two, maybe three cycle, and then there is nothing in VR. Inhibitor neurons keep going on. So there too shows massive enhancement, and eta rhythm plays a role, which I don't have time to go into. Let me not go into how this thing represents uh, distance and time at the same time, but let me just assert to you that another paper we published shows how it's the same neuron Using VR, we can turn into time or distance. So I can just assert to you for now that we can turn the same neuron into a place cell or time cell or a distance cell. Uh, so that's a major advancement because now it's not that one experiment gives you one and other experiment gives you another. Just by changing the stimuli, we can turn the neurons nature of abstraction. So very important for any research in AI and deep learning. How can we do that? Uh, what about the specific stimuli? Another beautiful set of research that we did got quite interesting. We found that these neurons have actually a multimodal representation of where the rat is looking at. We can even control it with using virtual reality. So let me skip that as well. That's all published. Let me tell you something else is coming, which will come out in print in nature next month. So we are on a roll, as I said. So rats running around in VR. But now there is no killer to tell him where the reward is. He has to figure out by triangulation. So he has to actually pay attention to that rather than the killer. So very hard. In fact, any one of you who comes to our lab and tries this, even though I can verbally tell you you have to find a hidden reward zone, you will have a hard time. It's a very difficult task, actually. It turns out we think it's easy, but it's very hard. Uh, and he figures out after trial, this is a well-trained rat, so he reaches somewhere, when he gets to the right spot, he gets a feedback saying you've reached, he gets a bit of reward, and then he gets teleported to another random spot. You notice there are sounds of frogs and crickets. Next trial, he gets there faster. I want a time to show you. This is the hidden reward zone. He goes there from many, many directions, from four different directions, chosen in pseudo-random fashion. So in fact, we find many surprising things here. Uh, so the title of this paper was Multisensory Control of Multimodal Behavior. Do the legs know what the tongue is doing? Very funny title. What we found is that actually something we never thought, like which you all of sure, I'm sure all of you must have experienced, is that your legs and your tongue don't behave the same way apart from different muscles. In the evening, you're hungry and you say, I want to be eat a healthy food and I'm going to go buy a salad. But on the way, you smell pizza and your legs take you to pizza shop. 
and all of a sudden you're chowing down on massively calorie rich pizzas. We find something like that in VR actually unbelievably. That's reward expectation behavior. Again, a deep part of reinforcement learning behaves completely different because we can measure different behaviors simultaneously than is navigational behavior, a uh, Pavlovian versus uh, spatial behavior. So you can read that up if you want. Very easy to read paper, no neuroscience here, just behavior. Now, the question becomes, how do you navigate? If the place cells are gone in VR, the classic test. So we recorded place cells and a brilliant graduate student, Jason Moore did this, now he's a postdoc. He did a lot more interesting stuff. So neuron is no place cell. How the hell can the rat navigate in VR if there are no place cells? Well, Jason did lots of cool things and I don't know why this freezes. So it turns out that if you use the sophisticated techniques of generalized linear model in AI, these neurons are actually multiplexing and they're representing space to a small amount, but they're representing distance based on how much distance the rat has traveled or egocentric or auto autobiographical memory that's going to come out in nature. So you'll read all about it or it's on bio archive as well. If you want, you can read about it. And then they can also encode distance. The same neuron can do all three things. In fact, they encode which way the rat is pointing. So very abstract representation, not just a simple, potentially boring thing called place, but where he is going to be in the future, which way he should go, how far he should go and where the reward is. So let me skip that uh, since I'll run out of time. It changes with experience. There's a lot of information about heavy and plasticity, highly correlated with behavior. The neural responses are, imagine this, each dot is a different session. We can decode from the activity of just few hundred neurons these different representations and how well the rat should perform. So x-axis is the rat's performance and y-axis is the how many cells were tuned. And you can see pretty massive correlation with different forms, which has never been seen before. So that works out. There is experience dependence and heavy and plasticity, which I will skip. Uh, and maybe very last thing I will tell you a little bit, you can do with nanotechnology, which we are doing. So in all these experiments that we did, and in fact, anybody in the neuroscience field did, as long as they were measuring activity from the brain in behaving animals. They were measuring activity from this soma. That's where the spikes are generated. And the classic idea of how the neurons work, which has been used in all the AI and deep networks, is a neuron is a simple point object. And the dendrites are simply cables. Cables simply send information to neuron and the neuron cell body does the reloop or the threshold nonlinearity and spike. Don't worry about the dendrites. They're just cables, they bring input to the cell body. But why are dendrites so huge? Dendrites can be much smaller like this. Why are they shooting off like this? Dendrites are where the excitatory synapses are and that's where learning happens. So what are they doing? Nobody has been able to measure what goes in dendrites. So we developed nanoprobes in the lab, uh, which can hold the dendrite like a bunch of chopsticks. And because you can't do any other technique. You can't do calcium imaging because that's calcium, voltage sensitive dyes. The signal here is so big and there are so many dendrite that get swamped. So even now, this is the only technique even today that somebody can measure the voltage in dendrite in freely behaving animal, exactly where the memories are. And that's essentially the idea. Again, brilliant work done by the same brilliant guy, Jason Moore. So it captures this and Kirchhoff's law gives you why that we can measure the membrane potential without going inside. And that's a dendritic signal. You hear the sound, right? It sounds totally different than the cellular signal. In fact, you don't hear the somatic spikes at all because they are 100 times smaller than dendritic spikes. Notice somatic spikes are 5x amplified. Those are tiny little things. These are gigantic dendritic spikes. And what we found is that actually dendrites are generating 10 times more spikes than the cell body. So if we are searching for the holy grail of how our brain creates intelligence, this threshold relu that we are using at the cell body is not the right way to go. So dendrites are doing completely different processing and we see a lot of things. I mean, I can show you the data. Uh, tons of it, but let me just conclude. 
uh, that hippocampal circuit does multisensory associations and the nature of association determines the diversity of neural responses, neural activity, predictive coding and task dependent navigation uh, improve rapidly within the session is correlated with navigational performance. This is the work that's coming out in Nature by Jason and I didn't have time to tell you about even more amazing experiment that uh, your RIT alumnus Chinmay Purandare did and theory where he developed an AR to die decode hippocampus. So that's coming out in Nature and then this is not unpublished anymore that came out in Nature Neuro. I already told you about it. Uh, and egocentric responses I told you about, and this already is no longer unpublished, came out in science. So let me uh, let me not go there at all. And let me just stop here. And uh, I'm going to, going to talk to you about grid cells and what they do. Let me find a way to get out of this whole thing. Oops, no imagination. Uh, stop sharing. All right. So let me stop here and take any questions that you may have any questions from the audience mayank i have a small a very basic question yeah um, first of all I mean, it's a fantastic talk really enjoyed i mean it's really you got excellent Thank results you. uh the thing is if you look at the place cells yeah right, they are able to extract uh, this kind of a High level information about the position from sensory yeah. data and right. So, yeah. are they strongly influenced by locomotion activity? Uh, how are they? Yeah, they are actually. They is are actually, the pathway they, worked out? I mean, from spinal cord to. We absolutely uh, great, great question. Yep, we are actually trying to work on that as well, as to what is that pathway, how does it work, and so on. We are actually quite keen on that. We are working towards that. Uh, so okay. yes, it is there. There is a problem of uh, choosing the origin of the coordinate system, right? Because it's doing integration. Yeah, yeah. that will so, give you very weird results if you don't find, you know, determine the origin properly. That's right. That? That's right. So, so as you as you're picking out on this, these are very challenging problems, right? Uh, while I boast about all these nature and science papers.